Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, I'm Bill. We're in the Mythic Adventures book for Pathfinder today. We are continuing the uh, War Magic series. We are on fourth level uh, arcane spells in the Mythic Adventure to continue the series. That just leaves fifth and sixth level spells, both divine and arcane to go over. So there's at least four more videos in this series to do. And after that, for this series, all the uh, spells will have been covered that I'm aware of for Pathfinder. I'll have to do a little bit of research, see if I missed anything, but I believe that covers everything. If that's the case, I might try to take another game system and do their magic and see what would be very useful as war magic spells, especially if their magic is different than what we're familiar with from D&D &D and uh, Pathfinder. So, fourth level spells. Animate Dead, that's always a useful spell. But let's look at the mythic version of Animate Dead. Add your tier to your caster level when determining how many hit dice of undead you can animate with a single casting of the spell. So if you had mythic levels, your mythic tiers, your mythic levels. If you had mythic levels, you could add that to how many hit dice of undead you could create, so you could create more undead with the casting of this spell. This doesn't increase the total number of hit dice worth of undead you can control. By expending a second use of mythic power, you can ignore the spell's material component cost. Augmented sixth. You can only do this if you were sixth tier, so sixth mythic level. If you expend two uses of mythic power, any skeletons or zombies you create gain either the agile or savage mythic template. This template lasts for a number of days equal to your tier. Alternatively, if you are 8th tier and expend 10 uses of Mythic Power, any skeleton you create permanently gains the Mythic Skeleton template. That's useful. So I could see putting that on even a one-use item and getting that amongst the enemy's uh, uh, dead at the end of, say, a single day's worth of battle, you can all of a sudden animate the enemy's dead and now they have a new thing they have to deal with. B-Shape 2. There it is. Each Mythic B-Shape spell must be learned individually, so this is a different one. And you must know the respective non-mythic B-shaped spell to learn its mythic version. You don't have to learn them in order and are not required to know a lower level mythic B spell before you learn a higher level one. Each mythic B spell adds the following benefits to respective non-mythic versions. The spell's bonus to increase uh, ability scores by two, the natural armor bonus increases by one, and the ability uh, score penalties decrease by two to a minimum of a zero penalty. Choose one natural attack type the animal form has, such as bite or claw. The critical multiplier for that attack type increases by one, maximum times four. Augmented second, if you expend two uses of mythic power, the ability score bonuses increase by an additional two. During each casting of the spell, a number of times per number of times equal to your tier, you can act as if you had natural spell feat for one round. For example, if you're second tier, you can uh, use the natural spell feat for two rounds per casting of the Mythic Beast spell. So I can see that being okay. If you could get the Mythic Beast onto someone else, like you're casting it, but you cast it on somebody else, or you give them an item that does that, that could be very interesting for them to transform and sort of add some fear to the normal soldiers on the battlefield. Black Tentacles. Add your tier to the base attack bonus of the tentacles. The tentacles also deal an additional 2d6 points of acid damage with a successful grapple. Augmented Sixth, if you expend two uses of mythic power, the spell creates twice as many tentacles in the same area, meaning each creature in the area is attacked twice per round. The tentacles can grapple creatures that are immune to grappling if the immunity is from a non-mythic source. 
but combat maneuver checks to grapple such creatures take a minus five penalty. So if you can get a bunch of black tentacles to appear, so they give you some one use items to your soldiers that they could chuck into the middle of the enemy, that would be very, very devastating. Confusion. Confusion always sounds like it'd be useful in a uh, military battle. Confusion. Roll on the table below instead of the non-mythic version at the start of each subject's turn to see what it does per round. Augmented. If you expend two uses of mythic power when casting the spell, you force one affected creature per round to roll on the table twice and take the higher result. It's a percentile roll, but there's only four effects that you could get out of the percentile. 25, 1 to 25, 26 to 50, 51 to 75, and 76 to 100. In the first one, the 1 to 25, subject acts normally but takes a minus 2 penalty on all attack rolls, skill checks, and ability checks until its next turn. On the 26 to 50, subject does nothing but babble incoherently and takes minus 4 penalty to AC until its next turn. 51 to 75, subject deals 2d8 points of damage plus strength modifier to self with item in hand. 76 to 100, subject attacks nearest ally. For this purpose, a familiar counts as an ally. So that can be very useful. If you could get that as a more of a mass effect, which you can't really do as the spell is, but say you had mass confusion, uh, you could essentially take out a larger portion of the uh, army, but if you just put confusion on a bunch of ammunition and gave them to your second, third, fourth row back as sling bullets, arrowheads, uh, bolts, and they fired into the enemy while the shield wall was clashing, all the ones that start attacking their allies would cause an immense amount of chaos. Contagion, that would be useful pre-battle. The affected target is highly contagious. Any creature it touches or that touches it with natural weapons or unarmed strikes must save or contract the disease. The save DC for these targets is equal to the spell's DC minus four. The target can't spread this disease to you. Augmented seventh. If you expend five uses of mythic power, the spell targets every living creature within one mile radius. You can select one creature per caster level within your line of sight. These creatures are unaffected by the spell. I could imagine you using that on a fortified area as the augmented version. That would be very effective on the enemy. But if you were using it as ammunition and attacking a sieged area and then backing off for a day or two, just keeping them locked in their place but not actively assaulting the walls, the disease would have time to spread. And that could be very demoralizing for that uh, side. Deathless. and Deathless is not in here. So as we continue with the series, we keep seeing where they have spells listed and no spell descriptions. Detect Scrying. Um, this spell automatically gives you the visual image of the creature scrying you if it's using a non-mythic means of scrying, you also gain an accurate sense of its direction and distance from you. You automatically succeed at caster level checks to overcome non-detection or similar effects. The block that block your ability to detect the creature. If you learn the creature's direction and distance within it, with this spell, you can, as an immediate action, cast a mind-affecting spell through the scrying sensor to target the creature. 
This spell affects only the scrying creature, even if the spell normally affects an area or multiple targets. You must expend a number of uses of mythic power equal to the level of the spell you wish to cast against the creature. If you expend two uses of mythic power, even mind blank doesn't prevent you from detecting the scrying creature. If you teleport to the creature's location within one minute, you arrive on target with no chance of error and bypass non-mythic effects that block teleportation. Alternatively, you can compel the creature to attempt to teleport to you within one minute. Will negates DC equal to 10 plus double your tier. It must use its own means of teleportation to do so, but you guarantee it arrives on target and bypasses non-mythic effects that block teleportation in your location. So that's interesting. I can see that being useful, especially for your uh, strike force, your players uh, using that. I can also see that being useful as the enemy's counter to being scryed on, especially where you can cast back through it. I'm already picturing incidences where I could use that on my own party. So if you're watching this party, I'm getting more ideas. Uh, Dimension Door and Dragon's Breath. Dimension Door. The duration of the spell changes to one round per two caster levels, and it creates a temporary, invisible, one-way portal in your square to your destination. You immediately pass through the portal and arrive at the destination, but you can't take any other creatures with you. When casting the spell, you can designate a number of creatures equal to your caster level, these creatures can see and use the portal, pass through it to arrive at the destination. This isn't an action. A creature that passes through the portal can't take any other actions until its next turn. And then what I say after that? Dragon's Breath. So, Dimension Door, used in that fashion, would be very useful. Um, say, you needed to be up on the wall or you wanted a strike force to assault the wall while the the rest of the military is trying to siege the wall and climb it. Uh, one use of that, say a one use item that a soldier activates, say it'd have to be one of your more skilled soldiers, one of your veteran soldiers, some somebody that had five hit dice or more, or your strike force being your players. They could use that, open up a portal there, and if it has enough duration that enough people can use it, say at least four people can use it, so that would be your normal uh, D and D party. Um, the first person uses it, and then the other three follow within a round or two, and they're all on the wall. Now they can take, or at least attack the and distract the soldiers that are on the wall, trying to defend the wall. I can see that being very, very useful. You could also use it to get in the flanking position behind your enemy, that's in, uh, that's already clashing, or you could use it to get to the archers of the enemy. It'd be a small force that got there, but that would disrupt the archery fire, and so on and so forth. If you have multiple of these items, now you have multiple forces that are showing up in these locations. And their numbers are increasing by the round because they can keep using the portal until at least four people go through the portal. I could see that being very devastating in a um, unable to protect your flank type of uh, situation. So next one was what, Dragon's Breath? Dragon's Breath. Dragon's Breath. The spell's duration changes to one minute per level or until discharged. You can use the breath weapon up to three times during this duration. On the round you cast the spell, using the breath weapon is a free action. Later uses require a standard action. You must wait 1d4 rounds between each use of the breath weapon. All uses for a particular casting have the same range, area, and energy type. You can have only one Dragon's Breath spell in effect at a time. Casting a new one ends the previous one. Dragon's Breath by itself is very devastating, so imagine giving that version to a few of the members in the second, third, fourth row. They drink a potion that gives them the Dragon's Breath, or in the case, because this is a fourth level spell, you wouldn't be able to put it in a potion. Say they have a one-use item that they crush a... Uh, a gem, crush a uh, pearl that gives them dragon's breath. Uh, and upon crushing it, they get the dragon's breath for 
in this case, a couple minutes that they can cast it three times total. That could be very, very devastating. Say the pearl is even taking this a little bit further. Say the pearl or object that they use has a dragon inscribed upon it, a specific type of dragon, so that if you were analyzing it without magic, you would kind of just make a spellcraft check to identify or a knowledge um, dragon or knowledge mythical beast uh, to identify it. You'd go, okay, so that's a blue dragon, so that and it's showing lightning. Or that's a white dragon that's showing ice. That's a red dragon that's showing fire. So on and so forth. So after that is elemental body one. Each mythic elemental body must be learned individually. So I'll skip that section because that's the repeat of earlier. The spell's bonus to ability scores increase by two, the natural armor increases by one, and the ability score penalties decrease by two, minimum penalty of zero. There's a 50% chance any critical hit or sneak attack against you is treated as normal hit, as if you were wearing medium fortified armor. Augmented third. If you expend two uses of mythic power, the ability score bonuses increase by an additional two. So in other words, this is the elemental version of B-shape. I like it, especially since it's treated like medium fortified armor. Instead of getting that attack bonus that the other one gave you, like crit bonus, this one gives you armor bonus. So that that's cool, I like that. Now imagine giving that to your strike force and all of a sudden they're a little bit harder to hit. Or giving them the beast form too. Give them both of those as a, a variation of what they can do, that would be very entertaining. It'd be very destructive too. Innervation. The number of negative levels inflicted increased to 1d6 and the target is sickened for 24 hours. And a dead creature struck by the ray gains 1d6 plus five, uh, times 5 temporary hit points. So between 5 and 30 temporary hit points for a number of hours equal to your caster level. Augmented third. If you expend two uses of mythic power, any creature attempting to remove the target's negative levels must succeed at a caster level check equal to DC 10 plus your caster level plus your tier. So I could see that being very useful. You put that on put that on ammunition. So instead of being a ray, the ammunition's the, the trigger. It hits somebody and it drops them 1d6 negative levels. Most of the soldiers that would be in a shield wall would max out at 5th level-ish if you're just using the generic rules for warriors and stuff for a battle. Your inexperienced ones would be 1st level, your seasoned ones would be 2nd level, your veterans would be between 3rd and 5th level. So that could kill most of the things that you're fighting too. So you put that on a, I don't know, you put that on a dozen uh, pieces of ammo and that's fired into a concentrated area, all of a sudden you create a weakness in like a shield wall that you can then exploit and start breaking their formation. You do that a couple more times in a couple other areas and all of a sudden you've disintegrated their ability to, to hold you there. Fire shield. Fire shield. The damage dealt to your attacks increases to 1d8 points of damage plus 1 per caster level, maximum plus 15. A chill shield gives you fire immunity. A warm shield gives you cold immunity. So the damage dealt to your attackers increases to 1d8 points of damage plus 1 per caster level. So if they attack you in melee, they take a d8 plus up to plus 15. So by the time you're casting this as an arcane spellcaster, you would have this at about about 8th level, 7 to 9, somewhere in there. I'd say 7th level, I think, is when you get 4th level spells as a wizard. So sorcerer, you might get it about the same time. It's at, at the time that you see 4th to 5th level spells, that's when the wizard and sorcerer, instead of the sorcerer being behind them, sort of uh, in gaining the spells at the same speed, finally catch up. 
And I love playing Sorceress, that's why I mentioned it. And Wizards are okay, it's just... I love the magic built into their blood. Their, their natural ability that they can cast the magic. Ice Storm. Now with the Fire Shield, have a bunch of your guys that are in the front of the shield wall. Drink this before they clash. All of a sudden, every time they're attacked, the attackers take damage. Enough damage dealt, the wall will disintegrate in front of them. So if they have some way to get fire shield on all of them, say they swallow this uh, tiny pearl, and that gives them the ability. While it's up, they can pretty much push through uh, the weaker part of the shield wall, the, the people that are level one and level two. And then the ones that are more experienced would be taking lots of damage as they're trying to fight back. Ice Storm. The bludgeoning damage increases to 4d8 points of damage, and the cold damage increases to 3d6 points of damage. The ground in the area is covered in ice and hailstones, acting as though a grease spell were cast on it. Dealing five or more points of fire damage to a square melts the ice and hail, negating the grease effect. Augmented Sixth. If you expend two uses of mythic power, one creature in the area is paralyzed, as if by whole person, and gains vulnerability to fire as long as it is paralyzed. That's pretty cool. Now imagine hitting them with Ice Storm in multiple locations where you could take out the rows. If you could get to their flanks and go long ways through their formation, you'd be able to decimate them in the damage from the bludgeoning, from the cold. Ice Storm is a pretty powerful effect. If you have it on a one-use item that's a trigger, a trap trigger, where they either have to touch it or they have to uh, interact with it in some way, maybe it's a very valuable piece of gold lying on the ground. They pick it up, and then all of a sudden an ice storm happens. You could use the center as the first square affected and then roll randomly to see what direction. If this is a trap, your forces should be far enough away. If it, you want to put it on your ammunition, you could launch an arrow, and on impact, it just follows the arrow path as far as creating the ice storm. And that could be also very effective if you're attacking a fortified area. You fire it over, it hits the person on the wall, but then it ice storms in that long uh, trajectory straight into the fortification. Monstrous Physique 2. I'm thinking this is similar to the Beast one and the, uh, the Elemental one. As far as learning them, learning them individually, that, that's all the same as the others. The spell bonus to abilities increased by two each. The natural armor increases by one, and the ability decreases ability penalty decreases by two each, minimum zero. Yep, it functions like the others. There's no major benefit that this gives you compared to the others, but it's still pretty cool and be very useful. And it'd be just as useful as how you'd use the B shape and the elemental body. Mythic Servants. And I do not see it. So yet again, another spell that is not in here. Interesting. 
named bullet. Increase critical multiplier of the target weapon by one, maximum times four. If you expend two uses of mythic power, the target ammunition or weapon returns to the creature that shot or threw it before the creature's next turn. Similar to returning weapon, the spell isn't discharged until the target is used to attempt a second attack against the named creature. Ammunition that hits uh, is destroyed and does not return. Pretty interesting. As far as using gunpowder weapons, that increased multiplier is always nice. Other than that, I don't see a lot of use for it, but if your military is using a lot of gun, a lot of guns, there would be a lot of use for it. Maybe it's something you rub on your, like an oil you apply to your gun that gives it that multiplier for at least the next battle. And it doesn't have to be a long battle, at least for the first 10 minutes of that battle. Phantasmal Killer, that's always a good one. Phantasmal Killer. If the target fails its will save, but succeeds at its fortitude save, the Phantasmal Killer persists in the target's mind, giving it the dazed condition until your next turn. On your next turn, the target must attempt another fortitude save against the Phantasm. Success means that it takes 3d6 points of damage. Failure means it dies from fear. So in other words, it gets twi two tricks before it dies from fear. Or it could die from fear. If you expend two uses of mythic power for the augmented sixth, the spell can affect a living creature that is immune to fear, illusions, or mind effects. So that would affect your paladins and other things that are immune to fear. That's interesting. I like that. But Phantasmal Killer is just great because it would cause a soldier to freak out and then all of a sudden die. 3d6 points of damage is nothing to, to sneeze at when you only have a handful of hit dice. You go to a veteran character and they have to make two saves. And if they make both saves, they take 3d6 both times. That's in danger of dropping one of the veteran uh, regular soldiers. Scorching Ash Form. The damage dealt increases to 3d6 points of fire damage. This otherwise makes the same changes as Mythic Gaseous Form. If you expend two uses of Mythic Power, the target can shift into or out of Scorching Ash Form as a move action. So as a gaseous form that does damage of 3d6 fire, that would be very mean. You could just roll over groups of the soldiers and do a lot of damage to them. Shout. The duration that creatures and the area are def deafened increases to 4d6 rounds, and the damage dealt increases to 5d8 points of sonic damage. The damage dealt to crystalline creatures and exposed br brittle or crystalline objects increases to 1d8 points of sonic damage per caster level, maximum 15d8. Crystalline creatures reverberate with sonic energy, taking four points of sonic damage on your turn for a number of rounds equal to your tier. Wow. Um, get that aimed towards your spellcasters or towards your commander that's commanding, enemy commander that's commanding the forces, and now they can't hear because of the deafen effect, as well as the amount of damage they would take sonic-wise, would be very interesting and devastating. So put that on, maybe put that on an arrow, call it a, a shouting arrow and fire its one-use object. Uh, aim it at the target that you want, and all of a sudden they take the effects of the shout spell when it impacts. Solid Fog.
the penalty on melee attacks and damage rolls increases to minus four. The cloud's radius and height both increase to 50 feet. Augmented. The augmented version of Mythic Solid Fog has the same additional benefits as the augmented version of Mythic Fog Cloud. Okay. So, but the melee and the damage rolls, that's interesting. Drop a few sling bullets with that in it and it creates these areas of solid fog where the forces have a harder time moving, have a harder time fighting. That'd be very interesting and add a lot of confusion to what's going on. Especially if they can only see the guy next to them and all of a sudden they can hear other effects that you have going on to their forces, but they can't see what they are. The fear would plague them and make it make their morale drop. Stone shape, stone skin. Stone shape, the duration changes to one round per level and instantaneous. Each round after the round you cast a spell, you can spend a standard action to shape up to five additional cubic feet of stone you touch. Shape stone has an instantaneous duration, meaning it does not revert to its previous form when the spell ends. Interesting. Stone shape's always a useful spell. Um, if you get very creative with it, you can create traps with it. You can use it to trap a powerful creature. I used it on a uh, brass golem before I was able to actually hurt a brass golem and pretty much sealed it in the floor and we just beat it until it ceased to function. So you can get very creative with stone shape. And it would always be very useful, especially in a siege where you're the defender. So stone skin adds the AC, that's always going to be useful. The target gains plus four bonus on saves against disease, poison, and stun effects. There's a 50% chance any critical hit or sneak attack against the target is treated as normal hit. That's if the target was wearing medium fortified armor. And then in addition to that, the regular AC bonus of stone skin, you could take that further and give that to a few of your characters that are in melee first, so the front of your row, have them activate this ability and all of a sudden they're harder to hit, harder to hurt, and they can just take take a few blows after blow and retaliate against the enemy. I wouldn't put it on your green soldiers. I would put it on those that have three hit dice or more and have them lead the charge into the enemy. True form, vomit twin, wall of fire, wall of ice. True form forces a target that can transform back into its hybrid or its other form. It's not going to be useful unless you know of somebody that is that in the enemy's forces, or you want to use it on your own guys that are that. Um, vomit Twin Vomit Twin seems like a weird spell any spell you cast that has a range of touch, close, medium, or long can originate from the twin instead of you. The twin gains a deflection bonus to AC equal to your tier and has hit points equal to double your caster level. The twin can <coughs> attempt attacks of opportunity using your base attack bonus but has no ability, uh, score modifiers, skills, or feats. It threatens an area appropriate for your size and wields a copy of the weapon you are wielding when you cast the Mythic Vomit Twin. The twin's weapon is destroyed or disarmed. On your turn, the twin generates a new weapon from its own substance. Its attacks still damage using the weapon's die type. So it'd give you an extra warrior. That'd be more useful for your strike forces than anything else. Wall of Fire and Wall of Ice. of fire. The wall's damage increases to 2d6 points of fire damage. 
to creatures within 10 feet, 1d6 points of fire damage to those past 10 feet but within 20 feet, and 2d8 points of damage uh, plus 1 points of fire damage per caster level to any creature passing through it. Any creature that passes through the wall is with or is within 5 feet of the wall when it's created must succeed at a reflex save or catch fire. Attempts to extinguish its fire uses the spell save DC. Augmented fifth, if you expend two uses of mythic power, you may move the wall five feet in any direction as a move action on your turn. Moving the wall into a fireproof barrier, such as a stone wall, destroys part of the wall that overlaps the barrier. So moving the firewall would allow you to cor corral the enemies. Um, just the firewall in general would be very devastating. It allow you if you cast it in the middle of the uh, shield wall, say the shield wall was four men deep and you were able to cut them off and there's only like one up against your shield wall, then a guy that's standing in the fire or right next to the fire, then somebody in the fire, well, they could pull their, re their rear of that line back, but the front of the line is going to A, get devastated by the fire and B, by your own forces, and then you could pull back and it, as long as that's up, That'd give you a break from the fight for a second. Wall of Ice. The wall hit points increase to five hit points per inch of thickness, and your tier add your tier uh, to strength check DCs to break through the wall. The damage dealt to those that step through the wall increases to 1d8 points of cold damage plus one per caster level. Any creature that passes through the wall must succeed at a fortitude save or be staggered for 1d4 rounds. This is a cold effect. If you expend two uses of mythic power, you can cover the wall in sharp, protruding icicles. Any creature that touches, strikes, or breaks through the wall takes 1d6 points of cold damage, 1d6 points of piercing damage, and one point of bleed damage. That would be just as useful as the fire, except it's more solid, so it's not going to necessarily do the radius effect of damage that the fire would do but it's going to separate the, physically separate the forces more. I see that being very useful too, especially if you can get the spikes up. So if you put the fire or that on one of these items with a predestined uh, line, and you can designate where that goes without being the spellcaster that casts it because it's one of these items, then you're going to have a lot of control of what's going on on the battlefield. You're going to be able to make it so their forces can't do a lot that your forces can't. And then defensively you could also drop this on places that are trying to siege you you could all of a sudden their their front line against the walls on fire <laughs> or being pushed back by this ice wall so you can get very creative with these which is the whole point of this uh war magic series so if you all have any interesting ideas for any of the spells we just went over put them in the comments below until we all game again guys